wanted to thank everyone for coming this morning. Actually, it's one time, so afternoon officially. Uh, this is our first in the leadership speaker series. It's called Leadership in Government and Public Service. One of the things that made us think about putting this on was just something I was talking through with some of our colleagues when it comes to developing our leaders here, our staff, our supervisors. Often there's a void in government and public service with that development process. Generally what happens is that you're doing a job very well individually. But then you're promoted to where you're doing a job you've never done before, supervising seven to ten individuals. Where did you learn that, that skill set to lead, to develop? So we wanted to make sure that we do our job as leaders and start training public officials and government workers. So that, that's where that hope came from, developing this generation of public servants into innovative and inspirational leaders is the responsibility of elected officials and government executives. We cannot effectively serve the public tomorrow without developing leaders today. So a smart person said that. Corbell Johns, I'm Corbell Johns of the Court Director for Domestic Relations and Juvenile Court. So our first speaker today that I wanted to, to have us be acquainted with was leading millennials in the workplace. Does anyone know what a millennial is? It's not me. <laughs> That I'm not going to agree with you on that, but uh, I'll, I'll let our, our speaker do that because you just put me in the spot, so I appreciate that. But millennials are basically who are coming out of college and who we're working with now, who are uh, filling the roles of our, our staff and are equipped with a mindset that many of us do not have. So we want to address that issue. So, Mark, can you put his bio up? One of the things also that um, uh, we have a group of professionals here, uh, Xenia is actually part of that leadership team. They have created Franklin County University where they actually will focus on those types of skill sets and developing those skill sets. So any of you are interested, and if you are interested in learning more about Franklin County University, Xenia, can you raise your hand? So we're I'm a great The anti-millennial? Um, no. <laughs> Yeah, please talk about. So one of the things we wanted to do is just under, let you understand the the, uh, the breadth of our speaker today. We gave you bios, some of you may not receive them, but Dr. Terrell Lamont Strayhorn is the director of the Center for Higher Education and Enterprise. He is also a professor of higher education in the Department of Educational Studies within the College of Education and Human Ecology at the Ohio State University where he serves as faculty research associate in the Kerwin Institute for the Studies of Race and Ethnicity in the Criminal Justice Research Center. He's also a senior research associate in the Todd A. Bell National Resource Center for African, African American Males and faculty affiliate in the Department of African and African American Studies, Sexuality Studies, Engineering Education, and Education Policy. Some of the things that's really interesting is how much he writes, how much his thoughts are taken into consideration in the area of higher education. How many people go to him for what we would consider as an expert, as someone who should define what it is in education that we, our children are, are facing on a daily basis. Obviously authored over 50 chapters and more than 300 international, national, and state conference papers, presentations, and keynote address. He's received several honors, named one of the most highly visible new scholars in this field by the Journal of Blacks in Higher Education. Dr. Strayhorn has received numerous national awards and honors, including the ASHE um, Early Career Promising Scholar Award, the ACPA Annual Acceptance Award, among others. So many of you, obviously, many of you um, should also take note that when you're one of the top 12 in your industry, and we have that person here, that's what we want to do at you know, county government. We want to start exposing you to the, to the leaders in the industry outside of work, outside of these walls, outside of these three or four buildings. So we're going to try to do that on a regular basis. We're going to do this every two months. 
forward to this um, coming year and we hope to continue to come back. So, Dr. Strait. series for um, those of you in leadership and in public service. Um, it's my great pleasure to be here. I am Terrell Strayhorn. Uh, a special round of applause for Orville John. <laughs> so, um, so, and a great round of applause for everyone who um, put together this concept about leadership in government and public uh, service. So yesterday, I was speaking at the Franklin County Children's Services um, office and spent the whole day there for professional development talking about um, leadership, talking about um, issues of empowerment, um, as well as a blend of other things. So, and I do not. In honor of Black History Month, uh, they asked me to come and to talk about empowering black youth. And so we did that. And we did it through a whole day of conversations and interaction. We got to talk about a lot of really important issues. Um, today, though, I want to, I've been given an assignment to talk about uh, leading millennials in the workplace. And so uh, Mr. Johns asked at the beginning, how many of you, how many, how many, I hear myself going in and out. Um, how many of you uh, know what a millennial is? And someone said, well, it's not me. Um, anybody know that they are a millennial? Yeah, a couple people know this. So we're going to talk about uh, who millennials are, and I'm going to do my best to talk about who, what we should do with that information um, about them. And so to get started, let's try this, Dr. Trayon. Yes. Let's see what he sounds like without his mic, we so it's not going in out. They can hear you. Can hear you okay. Yeah, I got, I got one of those voices that people pay for. No, I'm joking. <laughs> you guys know this is a new building, so we're obviously working out the, uh, the IP side of it. I'll use my, uh, my, my good speaking projection voice. And if I start dying down and you need to, to hear something I'm saying, just let me know. Um, okay, so interestingly, I grabbed the wrong briefing. So, and my book back is the other one. All right, so millennials in the workplace, who are they? Who are millennials? Yes, in your name, please. Don't you make people born in the 80s? Yes. Um, thank you, Don. So there's something that um, I'm going to, you know, the, the entire time I'm with you, I'm going to illustrate how you can lead and work with millennials in the workplace. I'll give you information about my center at the end. And so this is called, um, actually it's called CLIP, but in the workplace it could be called a reward. And millennials respond to reward. And something as simple as CLIP is gone. Duh, duh, duh. Uh, something as simple as a clip is something that a millennial um, takes great value in. And so I think those of us who get the fortunate pleasure to lead them in the workplace have to um, think with renewed sort of vision about rewards, what they look like. We're going to come to that. I don't want to get ahead of myself. Um, all right, so millennials, they were born in the 80s. Anything else we know about millennials? They only know digital. They only know digital. What's your name? Xenia? Yeah. Xenia. They only know digital. Okay. Um, so I'm going to build upon some of the things that you're offering there. And Xenia. Uh, Xenia. The reason why I'm going to walk these around to you versus having Derek, who's here, I should tell you that. So I'm joined today by Special Assistant to me and the Center for Higher Education Enterprise, Derek Tony Kelly. Uh, and uh, it, it's because. I want to know your name. So now I know your name is Doug and your name is Xenia because I, I walk these to you myself. This is also something that's really important when working with millennials. We'll come to why, but knowing them is really important. So 1980s born, 1980s on, as well as there's a connection between millennials and technology. Yes. Other things you know about millennials. Yes. 
Um, they are an instant group of young people being there, very microwave society. Mm -hmm. Very microwave society. Um, instant, frequent, what they call timely, what we call fast, right? So instant gratification, instant response, instant feedback, all of this is really important. Yes, in the back. If they, they change jobs frequently, they don't stay in one place like our father did, you know, they retire, they move around quite a bit. Right, what's your name? Larry? Larry. You're welcome, Larry. <laughs> um, so Larry offers something that is also true as a general tendency about millennials, and that is that if you look at them through your through whatever lens you're looking at them through, and I'm not going to reveal what generation I'm a part of, but I'll just say as I look at um, millennials, and whether you're a part of or, or a part of a different generation, if you look at them through your lens, they will appear to move jobs frequently. And they will also appear, which my grandmother used to say to me before she passed two years ago, she would say, you know, your generation is not loyal to employers, but my generation was loyal. We stayed with employers forever. And to be, we're going to interrogate that in just a moment. I don't want to add myself. But yeah, this idea of frequent job movement and loyalty to employers is one that we should think about when we want to lead millennials in the workplace. Anything else that comes to mind when you think about millennials? Born 1980 in affection and skill with technology. Um, mind boggling skill and deafness with technology, really. Um, I have as, a sense of uh, Okay, so I, I have to get more clips on my back for that. Um, <laughs> so, yes, your name is? Chris. Um, a sense of entitlement. A sense of entitlement. Huh? And Chris? Anyone else? Sense of entitlement. All right. Um, so here's what I think we want to talk about. How many of you in here know that you are leading millennials in the workplace right now? You have millennials on your team. Hands up, hands up, hands up. How many of you, okay, lots of people. How many people say, I might have millennials on my team? I'm not entirely sure. You might, you might, you might. Anybody say, I, there's not a single millennial on my team yet? Well, somebody can put your hands up. <laughs> you got to participate in this activity. Okay, so what, what's your, your story? Uh, you have millennials, you think you have millennials, or there are no well, millennials? Well, it depends on what I consider the team. If I consider the entire court my team, which is what I think you should do, then yes, I do. Okay. But if I consider just people that directly report to me, I do not believe I have them. Okay. And your name? Uh, Gina Paul. Jean? Gina. Gina. So Gina's helped us um, also in our understanding of what does this concept really mean and how it's going to apply because some of us have millennials on our team and we absolutely know it. And we either know it because somehow we found out their age, they talked about it, that this is not something that millennials hide. Um, or you can sort of guess that they, given if they start talking about when they graduated from high school, when they graduated from college, the kinds of things they put up in their office, you can start to surmise age, um, date of birth, and start to say, this person is probably a millennial. Those who said, I might have millennials, I'm not real sure, they look kind of young, they, but they act kind of old, I'm, not, I'm just confused. Um, that might be your situation. And then it also depends on how you conceptualize the team. Right? So if the court is your team, then certainly there are. And if not, but here's what we all have to take from this. Right now, the Census Bureau estimates that there are 75 million millennials in this country who are making their way into the workforce. What's so fascinating about this is I was going to give you a chapter that I wrote. I'm still happy to provide it. The problem with that chapter is it's really to educators, people who teach in, in, in educational settings. Um, some of the front matter is relevant to your work, but the back matter, the, the bulk of the chapter is not. So I decided to share orally with you a lot of the things I think you can take from that and other things I know about millennials, but I'm happy to provide the chapter if you just want to have an extra chapter to read on the Saturday. Um, so, but in that chapter, uh, one thing we know is that for this generation, it used to be the case, we talked about the fact that millennials were graduating from high school and moving into college. But that was almost, no, it was uh, over a decade ago. Right? Over a decade ago, the first set of millennials would have been moving into college, around about 2000. And so here we are, 2015, now 15 years later, and as a professor who used to be in school hearing about millennials, now teaching graduate students, graduate students are in graduate school. I mean, millennials are in graduate school. And what's really interesting to me, and this is my first story, it's my opening segment for this talk today, you gotta get ready for this. It is, okay, so I'm a professor at the University of Tennessee Knoxville, my former institution. And you know, and you give grades because that's what professors do to students. You do assignments and we grade them. 
And so I graded a student's assignment. And I thought the student did a really poor job on the assignment. I thought it was very clear about the expectations. The syllabus outlined what was expected in the assignment, and the student did what they did, and I assessed it. And what I really should have given the student was an F, because each element of the assignment was not completed the way I thought it was. And not to mention, in a class of 32 people, 31 people completed it right. This one person stands out as an outlier, but I'm kind, I'm from the South. I was born in Virginia, so you don't give Fs when you're from the South. You, all Fs automatically turn to Ds. And that just sounds better. So then I thought, well, not only is this, this kid, you know, he's probably trying his hardest, so I'll round up and give him a C minus. Thinking that I had done something, you know, um, rewardable, something commendable, moving an F to a C minus, I issued the grade. And for the first time in my academic career, I got a phone call as a graduate professor teaching a master's student. <laughs> Not the student. The student never came to me and said, I have a problem with the C minus you gave me. Can we talk about it? The mom and dad called me. And I thought, what is this called? And it's called the right? So um, how is this, how do we get to this point? Let's talk for a second. And I just want you to, um, you know, if you have questions, you will not throw me off. And um, I just want to talk a little bit about millennials. What do we know about them? And there are cards with my handwritten notes on it in my bag, I think, um, my Marriott cards. So, uh, so in, in millennials, so they're born 1980 and beyond, right? And right now, um, most of them are finishing college and moving into the workplace. What do we know about them? And I'm going to talk about what do we know from a search in theory. And uh, the one thing we know is that they are the largest generational cohort in history. The largest. They're larger than baby boomers. They're larger than Generation X. They're larger. The largest college, I mean, largest uh, generation cohort in history. How do we know they're larger? And there are all sorts of factors that lead to that. They're going to come up in, uh, as we start thinking about how do we lead them. One is they are um, due to immigration uh, trends and increasing birth rates among ethnic and racial minority groups. So many more groups of color, students of color, families of color, a number producing a larger generation. So due to birth rates and immigration movement trends, this cohort is larger than any other. First thing. Second thing we know is that on average, most of them um, have enormous confidence in themselves. Now, people always critique this and say, this is really bad, they're sort of arrogant as a generation. And there is an element of um, and, and it's not their fault. We'll talk about some of this. By the way, this is the generation that um, grew up with um, bumper stickers. Parents had bumper stickers that said, you know, my honorable kid goes to, no seriously. <laughs> Mom and dad bought 40, 50, $60,000 cars and then put bumper stickers on them <laughs> because their kid went to a middle school. <laughs> and, and the young person internalized meaning from that. That's what we got We as the leaders in the workplace have to be sensitive to this. So first of all, they're the largest um, generation. That's one. The second is that they are um, the most. They are avid users of technology. Avid users of technology. This group, this generation, the millennials, um, have always had cell phones since the, they were born. Like little babies, they could have had men. They just can't give them cell phones to a baby. But if they could, they would have had them. But let me tell you this: on average. What we've learned is that for the millennial generation, most of them got um, cell phones when they were, on average, about seven or eight years old. Seven or eight. By nine, most of them have them. Certainly by their teenage years, all of them have them. Cell phones. And people say, well, that's really impressive. Actually, it's not, because um, what they've also had is Facebook. They've always had access to some social media. MySpace. Gave away Facebook, LinkedIn, we'll come to LinkedIn in a moment, has enormous um, implications to our work with this generation, I think, as well. So they're avid users of technology. Uh, Forbes magazine and all other magazines named them the most connected generation ever. Most connected. Uh, let's see. They are a generation that was raised to very, very protective parents. And so this explains why. 
my graduate student's parent calls me to complain about the grade because mom, dad, and or guardian have always been doing that. And you know, before we blame them, they're called helicopter parents in the literature, but before we sort of point our fingers and say bad helicopter parents, because some of us might be helicopter parents, um, it's also important to realize that some of this relates to what was happening in society. So this is the generation that grew up Columbine. This is the generation that grew. There have been more school shootings and massacres in this generation's experience than any other generation. So safety at school has been a really serious matter for the millennial generation and their parents. And therefore, parents have responded by doing a lot more things that previous generations would have called coddling or overprotectiveness. I think that over part is a little inappropriate just because it's a different generation. We grew up to a different set of circumstances, right? So the cell phone, a lot of parents would say, well, yeah, my kid has a cell phone, and they had it since they were nine. It wasn't because they just said, well, here, be rich and have a cell phone. They said, I want you to be able to call me when you get to your friend's house because I don't trust society that you can get there and back safely. And if you run into problems, I want you to have immediate contact to me. So this technology and societal trends all connect with this. They had um, highly in, uh, protective parents. But this protectiveness has also another um, dimension to it that we should think about as those who work with them in the workplace, as co uh, coworkers, as well as those who lead them in the workplace. And that is that by and large, millennials have had highly structured lives. Highly structured lives. But the part that no one ever puts out there enough is that that structure was not developed by them. It was imposed on them by parents and guardians and teachers and coaches and piano teachers and pastors. Every single, I mean, external authorities impose enormous structure on their life, right? So they come knowing how to carry out a schedule. Great but not necessarily knowing how to build a schedule. So if you, if you work with them in the workplace, especially if you're leading in the workplace and you feel like, wow, there's, a, there's enormous talent and potential here, but where's that, that leadership that I'm looking for? That's, that's, the, that's the consequence of having uh, a, an upbringing where structure is imposed. You can follow the rules, but creating the rules is not something that you've had a lot of experience doing. So I think, one, this is really important for those of us who live through the workplace, but also, we'll come to this too, about staff development. We have to help them develop those skills those leadership, initiative, self-directedness skills, sometimes even in the workplace. Okay, um, and then the other part is really important. So they've had a lot of contact with diverse people. They're a very large generational cohort. They're an enormously diverse generational cohort. cohort. Also, and that's diverse across a lot of different dimensions of difference. So in terms of race and ethnicity, yes. In terms of social class, yes in terms of political opinions, in terms of social class, in terms of um, sexual orientation, all enormously diverse. This generation called millennials, there's always been at least one gay character on television. Always. They don't know what the world is like without um, diversity in television shows. Right? So then that shows up in the, in the um, workplace. They are used to high contact with diverse people. We'll come to this, what happens when they don't have that. Okay, a couple more points before we move into then what are the implications of this. This is describing the generation. Um, in terms of the generation, on average, they are quite competent. And that competence in the workplace um, sort of translates into what we call, they're very entrepreneurial. So we're right, you're right. They um, can sometimes be read as disloyal or not loyal to a single employer. Really out for themselves is how people talk about it. But I don't know that that's the most appropriate assessment of the generation. They are entrepreneurial. How do I know this? 92% of them on average believe they can be president of the United States. The highest percentage of any generational cohort in history. Almost all of them believe that they can be president of the United States. There are lots of good reasons why. I mean, they've grown up in a society where, first of all, they've seen a black president, right? And they've seen lots and lots of women and people of color and GLBT individuals make it into Congress and to make it into elected uh, positions. So the sky is the limit for them. Not only that, if they ever doubted that the sky was the limit, they have mom, dad, and guardian tell them, you're, you're special. Why? Because you're my kid, <laughs> right? So that, that adds to this. Along with this, um, we've, we've seen a sort of error 
around a lot of social movements that have opened up access for lots of different groups, and they've witnessed that. They didn't fight in all of those, but they certainly have been the beneficiaries of a lot of those social movements, which creates this spirit of entrepreneur. The other part is 92% of them believe they can be president of the United States. 72, no, 70% of them uh, want to be their own boss. So it's kind of hard when 70% want to be their own boss for them to say, well, then I'll be loyal to you as my boss, right? Not exactly, because many of them, 70% of them want to be their own boss. But many of them understand that there is a process. There are steps they have to go through to get there. But to Beverly's point, they're impatient with that process. So they, they understand, I want to be my own boss. I probably have to have a job or two, not five or six, not 15 years of experience, right? Just a job or two to get there. And they want to know the process, the steps for getting there. And they turn to us as supervisors and employers and mentors and more senior co-workers for that kind of input. I know where I'm going. I know I want to get there. How do I get there? What's the steps? Again, setting schedules and plans and steps are not their strong suit. They've never had to do that. They've never had to do that, okay? Uh, so it's not that they're necessarily arrogant and that that's why they want to be their own boss. I think a lot more of it has to do with they have a lot of ideas. Their ideas have been celebrated. I forgot about my story about the parent. I didn't. The parent's problem was that I gave the student a C minus because they failed to satisfy the objectives of my assignment. The mom's first response was that he turned in the assignment. He got the assignment done. Yeah, okay. And and showing up doesn't is not half the battle, actually. <laughs> Contrary to what popular belief is not, is not half the battle. Fighting the battle is the point, not just showing up. So I told mom, no, just turning in the assignment doesn't, doesn't work. Well, I mean, he gave it his best shot. I'm sure he tried. I know my kid. He's tried his whole life, right? Um, and he has really good ideas. I'm not saying he doesn't have good ideas. I'm saying that his good ideas didn't map onto my assignment. But this is a problem. This is a problem. Um, it's for educators, but it's also for those of us who work with them. Um, this is a generation that has grown up with stickers and check marks and A pluses, and a lot of people who, um, you know, it's, in education we talk about social promotion for this generation, but there's been a level of that um, rewarding just for effort, rewarding just for showing up, rewarding just for giving your hard try, and all of those things are absolutely essential. They are great things to do, but they're not the end of the day. They're not the outcome that many of us need as employers for them. So a lot of them have really good ideas, and those ideas have been praised all their life. So now they come to us, and they say, guess what? I have an idea about how we should do this. And you're thinking, you, you just got here. How, you just started. How? There are like five people who have been here much longer who have ideas, and you don't, you don't realize that there's a hierarchy? And the answer is no. They don't. And they also don't really have a whole lot of patience for hierarchy. Um, so it's not, even if they understand it, it's not that they're going to say, oh, okay, then I'll just wait my turn. And partly because they've never had to do this. They've not always had to do this. So they have really good ideas. And so I'm not saying that um, Ohio State or that Franklin County um, should be the only ones to respond to this because lots of companies have. I'll give you two examples. Google, who realized that this was happening um, some time ago, instituted their 20% time plan. Anybody know what this is? So Google employees, they give their employees upon hiring 20% of their time they can have. They work for Google full-time. Full-time is 80% for Google, 20% for yourself. Pursue your own ideas. They add it to it. If you go to the Google website, there's something like Google Widgets, Google Add-ins, Google Lab is what it's called. And they give to their employees 20% of their time. Try out your own ideas. If you come up with something worth having, put it in the lab. Let's experiment with it across the country. And if it becomes something that people really use, we'll move it to prime time. Imagine what that would look like in our work settings. We Imagine what that would look like, leading millennials in the workplace and giving them percent of their time back. Um, I can tell you, I, I work with millennials, and this idea has potential. Um, I've actually had folks who work in my center who have said to me, you know what, I really love what we do in the center, but I have a couple of ideas of my own that I want to sort of pursue, and I'm just wondering how I can fit that into my, my job description. And generations ago, that people would have been like, are you? What is happening right now? Someone pinched me. Am I being punked? Look for the camera, right? No. But in fact, that's exactly it's not only that that is their feel, there's an expectation. There's an expectation 
for accommodation in the workplace that we have to respond to it now. How we're gonna to respond to it, uh, Orville Johns told me to leave you with a couple of points. I'm gonna leave you with some stuff to think about, but I think there's a lot to think about how we might accommodate and respond to all of this. Okay, so um, they have really good ideas and Google responded that way. Disney, um, who employs a lot of millennials, also responded this way, I saw that. Yes, Dina. Um, they responded with what they call the Clear Blue Sky Initiative. Clear Blue Sky Initiative. And what it does is it tells employers of Disney um, work for four days, and the fifth day you get to decide how you want to do that. And the clear blue sky, the sky's the limit. If you want to come in, come in. If you want to stay at home, stay at home. If you want, if you have something you think that Disney ought to be doing, some partnership or whatever, then we should talk about that. So the fifth day is yours to do. By the way, these are not then considered part-time employees; they're full-time employees who have the fifth day to do what they want. All right. So let's talk a little bit now. Those are that's the general characteristics of this um, this generation. And then let me talk a little bit about uh, their expectations as a result of all of this. This generation then um, has high expectations in terms of structuring the workplace. Before I knew what that meant, I guessed at what structure was because structure, the way I think of the word, is not what they're talking about necessarily. They don't want you to say, sit down, stand up. Now you can go to the restroom. Now you can check your email. Now I'm shutting off access to your email, and I'm going to let you use your cell phone for five minutes. That's not what they're looking for. That's called control. Um, what they're looking for is structure, and it has to do with expectations, um, goals, directions, and feedback. Feedback is critical to the kind of structure that they – a highly structured work environment is one where the assignments or the expectations, the goals are clear and clearly communicated. But they are also getting feedback constantly, frequently, about their progress towards those goals. Okay? Um, they're also looking for a workplace that is team-oriented because they've grown up working on teams. In schools, in on sports, lots of team stuff. Teachers taught them in teams. There was all, you know, collaborative learning was a pedagogical sort of innovation during the time they were in school, that we gotta have more collaborative teamwork. The end is the, the end goal is a solution or an answer, but the team pitches into that. And then they come to the workplace and on average, they're looking for um, opportunities for teamwork. But this is the part that's gonna be interesting when we come to you all talking in a moment to me and hopefully raise some good questions, and that is they're also looking for friends. Friends, and let me tell you, my experience working with millennials in the workplace, and this is not even the millennial. I'm not talking about people who were born in 1980 or 1982. I'm talking about people who were born in 1989, and, and those kind of later years, extremely new to the workplace, come with very different, some people would call unusual, expectations about friendships in the workplace. <laughs> people who don't know how to manage Facebook interactions with coworkers. Um, what, how do you date? Can you date? Can you date everybody in the workplace? <laughs> all at once sometimes. You know what I mean? <laughs> there are all sorts of things that happen with this generation. Um, and, what is, and, and what counts as a friendship or as a relationship? Right? So we've got to think about that. Um, so there's that. Then there's this other part that I think is really, we can harness this. This is a really good strength. On average, they are confident, but that also um, imbues in them a can-do attitude. That really there's not anything that we could probably imagine asking them to do that they don't think they can do. I think that's a good thing. I think that's a strength that can be harnessed. But here's what I'm learning about it, and by learning, I mean I think about it in my role as a center director, and then when I got the invitation from Mr. John to come and speak, I thought even more deeply about it. Um, the communication and the feedback piece are related to this can-do attitude. So I've had times where I will say to someone who I now know is a millennial, I just know they're a millennial and they work in my center, and I'll say, go do this, or here's the assignment, here's what we want to do, we want to make sure at the end, here are the outcomes, and we'll make sure we hit one, two, and three in the middle. You clear? Okay, go do it. And then two days later, they'll come back and say, now, so I started down doing this, and I'm like, what? That's not even what, in my head, I'm saying this out loud, but I'm thinking, that's not at all what I just told you to do two days ago. And you left out of here thinking like, I got it, okay, just stop talking, I'm gonna go do this. Before you know it, they're down a different path. Or they rush off to do what they thought was easy to do, 
and they discover that it's not as easy as it sounded. And they sort of um, attempt, try and try and try again, versus coming and asking for help and saying, I'm not really connecting the dots here, I need your assistance. And so this idea that they can do um, everything is, is great, except that that can-do attitude on average, and this is not true of every single millennium, but it is a general tendency of the, uh, the generation, that it persists even when they cannot do it. These are a generation of students who um, wanted to be engineers, though they failed math and science. <laughs> Uh, want to be world-class musicians, but don't want to practice. <coughs> so then they come in the workplace, and they want to own their own business or have your job. But don't want to go through the steps to get there. right? So how do we then lead them? And how do we cultivate that optimism, that confidence, in a way that is appropriate for the workplace? And also, in the end, which is all about the Center for Higher Education Enterprises, about their success, we want them to be successful. How do we get them there? I think there are some things we can do. Uh, so here's another thing you got to know. They look for positive feedback almost daily. By the way, I did not say they look for feedback. You didn't hear me say that. You did not hear me say that. Did you hear me say that? I didn't say that. I said they, they want positive feedback. <laughs> positive feedback. And so when there's negative feedback, it's our job to figure out how to make negative sound good. So we should say, I'm positively certain you're doing crappy job. <laughs> Absolutely. No. Um, you know how you do it? So there are a couple strategies that we'll talk, we can talk about. Um, but you, first of all, you figure out what's the message you got to carry. And if the message is you're doing a crappy job, you start off saying, what in here can I start? What's, what's the way to start? What in here can I say they've done well? And if you've never had to think about it before as a supervisor, as a, as a co-worker, but you want them to be successful and you want to um, reduce workplace conflict, you got to do it. What can I say positive? I really appreciate your effort on this. And I, and I can tell that you try, you really, you put a, t a lot of time on this. And so um, I appreciate where you're going with it. I have a couple of things that I think will help it nudge it along a bit further. Right, so you don't say, I, I'm gonna print this on paper. What in the world happened here? <laughs> yes. Yes. That's not gonna happen. Because um, one, they've never had to deal with direct feedback um, like that. That doesn't mean they shouldn't have to. I, I firmly believe they should. So our assignment, our um, goal, what our charge is, is to certainly give them the feedback. Just realize that the feedback you're giving is in an upward, an upward hill. You're going against a sort of um, lifetime at that point of feedback not looking that way. And if a, and if a person tells you, if a millennial tells you, I don't no one has ever told me I cannot write. They're telling you the truth. They are probably telling, no one's ever told me that I wasn't good at this. They're probably telling you the truth. That doesn't mean you can't tell them, okay, so starting today, we're going to have to both accept that there's some growth, room for growth here. But room for growth is different than crappy job. Yes, that. If there's negative feedback, what then is going to be the result on them believe that if you give them constant negative instead of the positive. Okay. If, if you give them constant negative feedback, yes. um, a millennial, yes. you won't have to worry about it because they won't be there. <laughs> they will not be there. They will leave. The one thing that we know in Forbes magazine says is far better than I do is that um, the average tenure of millennials is far shorter than any previous generation and reasons for leaving reasons for leaving are also different. One of them is feedback. Constant feedback of non-performance. So you have to think about it. They're a generation who is used to being able to get things done. First of all, they believe they can get everything done. And then they're used to being able to um, achieve complete tasks that are before them. And so when they are in a workplace and the feedback they're getting is you're still not cutting, you're still not, you're still not meeting the expectation. You're still doing a bad job, still doing a bad job. It worries, it deflates, it wears on their confidence. And they're sort of built to protect their confidence. So they move very quickly. And there's lots of opportunities for them in this generation too. So um, you don't have a whole lot of time to give them really bad feedback before they start looking. And their commitment to employer, however you want to frame that, 
is much shorter than previous generations. So I think you do have to think about how to, how to have that conversation, yes? Now, here's the other thing that gets to these two points about why, why would they you know, sort of shut down or why is it that they get bad feedback, they, they um, leave. They, they, there's a sort of flight um, experience for them. And that's this. This generation also has some skills that we as co-workers and as employers um, like need. Need. And they know it. Right? So... Though I am, I'm not, you know, a baby boomer. I'm, I'm in a different generation, um, and I can use technology very well. One person who makes my head hurt using technology is Derek. I mean, Derek is, in a, he's a whiz, and some literally sometimes when I'm at this computer, I just have to turn my head because he's doing too much on it. At one time, for me, like keep up, I'm about to pass out. And he's like got screens flying and email going, and this is up. And I say, well, what about Twitter? He's got Twitter sent, and now he's on. And it's and it absolutely is comfortable for him that multitasking pace. And as an employer of Derek, I benefit. I benefit because I don't have to worry about managing all of that because I have people who. Do it on a regular, not just for the company. He does it for his own life, personal life, right? So that skill is something that a lot of folks who hire, because they're older on average, um, don't have, and they're looking for. So the moment that you know, I tell Derek, "You're not good at your job. You're not good at your job. You're not good at your job." Someone else is going to say, "Derek, you're a whiz at that computer. I need you on my team." He's going to say, "Well, forget you, straight board. I'm out of here. I'm going to go over here until this guy tells me I'm bad, and then I'll go find someone else, right?" <laughs> Um, so that's, that's, that's the connection between those points. Um, they're confident in their ideas, they multitask, they're flexible. Um, I just want to reiterate that they want to know where they're headed. They've always had plans and, and, and um, self, not self, externally imposed plans that chart where they're going. This is a generation that on average woke up, went downstairs to wherever mom and dad posted the schedule, and they sort of looked at what their life was going to be. They said, oh, okay, yeah, I have to and the same is true for when they come to the workplace and you say, well, you're, you're hired and you're working full time, nine to five. Here's your office. And they sit down at that desk and they say, now what in the world am I supposed to do from nine to five? And now you're giving me four things to do. Are you going to tell me how long I'm supposed to spend on each of these or like which one comes first? And what do I do if I need more time? On? And that's the kind of guidance and structure that they require in the workplace. And I'm going to say us, but you know, many of us work in places, or should, um, think about how do we orient new team members. And so orientation, HR can help us in some of this. How do you let them understand? That was one thing that when I started hiring people on my team, I realized I was bringing folks who had, worked, had never worked before. This is their first job. Um, that I am not a, I'm not a micromanager, but I became curious about how people spend their time. And so I started asking people, like, I just want you to do me, it's, it's just, I'm not monitoring you, it's just my own edification. I want you to keep a log of how you spend time each day and just turn it in to me at the end of the week. And then I looked across multiple employees and they couldn't be more different. People who I gave something to or, the, or their center needed them to do something that should take an hour, who broke it over nine hours, sometimes three days. Um, while other people structured their time very orderly and, and had tasks they checked off. So then I realized, well, if we're all different across these dimensions, maybe we can learn. There's, there are certain ways that I, as the director, like better than the other. And in terms of the, the company, they're more efficient that way. So then one, I shared that information with all of us for our own edification, but also those people who I thought had a really good way of structuring their day, like Derek, I said, I want you to present at our next staff meeting. I want you to talk to people about how you organize your time how you take three tasks that the center needs and then schedule it over the course of your week. So in many ways, um, team meetings that are usually for information sharing also became instructional. Okay, and then last, um, connections are really important to this group and the connections, that's why I said we're gonna come back to LinkedIn. LinkedIn is a good, 
cultural artifact of the millennial generation, right? Because um, I would have said Facebook, except that this generation is increasingly off of Facebook. Um, and LinkedIn, for professional reasons, becomes their site. And what they do is they sort of link with all of us. And many of us who are anywhere before millennials um, might not even be on LinkedIn, right? There are people in here who are not on LinkedIn. Yes, right? And then those of you who said, I'm going to be um, forward thinking, I'm going to get on LinkedIn, might not be using LinkedIn a whole lot. You just sort of let people link in with you. But there's a generation of, of folks who use LinkedIn. And they use it for the moment that feedback gets too intense. Or here's the part we got to understand. It. I want my own employers, everything on the camera, I want my own employers to hear this. Um, you know, this is not a generation of people who are motivated by money. Let that sink in. I know. They're not. It looks like money, and there are aspects of it. There are certain they want to make money. I mean, they have to because we built a capitalist society that requires it. But they're not motivated by money. If you um, don't believe me, pick up Time Magazine, Ford Magazine, talk to a millennial at length, and say things like, which one of the following would you prefer? About another $10,000 in salary, or the freedom and flexibility to set your own work out? And they would choose the work hours over the $10,000. Say, well, here's another exercise. You want another $5,000 in your salary plus a corner office with big windows like this? Or do you want to take a month off in the summer and go um, backpacking in Athens, Greece, and then save the latter? So they want rewards. But they don't like the rewards that previous generations wanted. Now, here's one that looks like money, but it's not. Um, so which one of the following do you want? Another... Uh, $5,000 in salary, or do you want me to promote your title from assistant director to director and program coordinator? And they're going to say the latter. Like if I had to pick, I'm going to stay an assistant director with $5,000 more, but I get this other fancy title. Give me the fancy title and just keep my salary the same. And again, that has a lot to do with the path. Where, where am I headed? So, they, they have goals. You know, like to be at the top. And this movement from assistant to associate to director to from office worker to office owner is, is a lot for them, right? So rewards are important, but they're not the rewards of, of previous generations. So we have to think about that. So let me stop by saying, here's what I think some takeaways. Um, one, although I just talked to you about the millennials as if they're all the same, I want us all to at least leave realizing that there are differences in this generation. You will certainly meet a millennial who does not fit this profile perfectly. Then you'll meet some who say they got five of those things, but then there are three things that are very different because there's diversity amongst all generations. Um, the second thing is that if you're going to work with them and lead them in the workplace, you have to set high expectations. Believe that they can do um, enormous and boundless kinds of things, and they can. All, all workers can. Workers respond to high expectations. Um, but you have to provide structure. So think about this. It's stuff I've never thought about when I came into this role, but I'm learning more and more how to do it. So you got to think due dates. People need due dates stuff. Long gone in the days of, oh, you could go do this for me. And then you're like, three months later, did you ever do that? And I said, well, you never told me when. You just said do it. I didn't. Due dates. Structure. So think due dates. Um, meetings with agenda and minutes. Um, including in time in meetings. It doesn't have to be like unit-wide meetings, but even one-on-one -on -one meetings. Taking people out to coffee to talk about not just how did you do on that last task or how are you um, on this last assignment or how are you in this last... Um, project that the team was pursuing, but how are you as a person? If you want them to leave, other than feedback, it's going to be because my employer doesn't care about me. Care about me. So they want you to know their name. It's okay if you know their favorite color, who they're dating, if they're dating, and the nature of their last breakup. All that stuff is really important. Let me tell you, I'm serious. I mean, I've sat down with employees and I'm like, why am I having this conversation? <laughs> and it's because they're my employee and it's important to them and even if it's not important to me no matter how close we are in age it doesn't matter that is important like it matters that we as their co-workers and certainly those of us who supervise and lead them that we signal that they matter they're looking for belonging they're looking for um, connections in the workplace and so this is important think due dates think meetings think agenda um, always think paperless if you can Right, so how can we move things to electronic media? Agenda for meetings and minutes sent out.
beforehand. Um, and if you can't, if you have the will to do it, but you can't really imagine how uh, technology can be harnessed for what you're trying to do, invite them in the conversation. They have ideas, lots of ideas. So say, look, I'm trying to cut down the paper in the office. I'm trying to think how we can get our message out to more people. What ideas come to mind? They have really good ones that can be um, thought about. And then also think about how do you offer feedback, uh, track progress, and set metrics for their success. So if you ever feel like um, millennials are often just looking for something like, how am I doing? How am I doing? Did I do okay? How did I do with that? Okay, so I did this, but you never told me how I did on it. If you're looking for that kind of feedback, input about progress toward those goals, um, and to set metrics. I think we should encourage their can-do attitude. That's really important. Um, don't squash that optimism. Embrace it, but also provide the necessary leadership. And I think we should over-communicate. Those are my own words. Over-communicate our expectations. So when we say, here's what I'm asking you to do. You, you sound good? You're clear? Okay, tell me back what I just said to you. Like, what do you hear me saying that you're going to go do? Okay. Yeah, that sounds right. Okay, so I still hear it. This is the three things you're going to go do. Okay, take care. Now, they're going to be, you know, think that they got it. But that over-communication and re repetition um, will actually end up, I think, ensuring efficiency so we're not going back and forth all the time about the same thing, but also that the end product, the outcome will be better. Um, take advantage of their comfort with teams. Encourage them to join teams. Think about how you might use teams and work with them. Something that a lot of millennials will probably pay me five dollars for saying this, but listen to them. They have ideas. All their ideas are not ready for prime time, but neither are, are ours, <laughs> right? Um, so listen to their ideas. Some of my best. I, I, I have to tell you this. Um, I don't know if I have a business card, but if I do, you should see it. My business card is one card front and back, and I was. Somewhere speaking, I used to have two business cards. And a millennial, who has not yet made it to the workplace, said, why do you have two business cards? I said, because I have my card as being a director, and my card as being a professor. He said, you should put it on one card. It'd be easier for you to carry around. It looks like you can't even do that very easily. Not right now, anyway. I thought, of it. who has a card on both sides? I've never seen it before. And why can't you do it? So I came back and I said, I'll do it. He said, oh, and by the way, when you do it, um, give me your business card. He wrote up there, my Twitter. Handle was not on my business card. My Facebook was not on my business card. He said, Pete, you're a public speaker. How will people be able to locate you? It was a great idea. And it was not mine. It was his. I would, I would look at that business card all day. I would have never realize that some of my most essential contact information is not up there. But he helped me see that. So they have great ideas. Listen to them. Some of their ideas are worth pursuing immediately. The moment you get back to campus like me. Sometimes, or the moment you get back to your office in your case. Um, but sometimes they're not. Sometimes they're, you know, they're ideas that need to be uh, developed a bit further, but can ultimately really help improve the workplace. And then, uh, I talked about money. My last one is work is life, and vice versa. So what I mean by that is not that work is life and that's it. It's that there really, for them, is no separation between work and life and fun and friendships and relationships and good times and bad times. They, you know, the world is the world. And so where I think this is important is if you are a person who knows how to separate what happens at home from what happens in the workplace, you can have a big argument at home, you get to the workplace, no one has to know about it. That is not a millennial. A millennial is going to let everyone of us know. I had a big argument this morning. And so if you want to speak to me, do not speak to me right now because I'm still fuming about this argument. And guess what? I'm sick too. And because I'm sick, I want all y'all to know that I'm not feeling well. Right? So there's, and it's not because they, um, and those are behaviors that have to be cultivated, have to be worked on, developed. But the reason why is because they move through the world as um, sort of adventurers of the world. The world is their, is their life. There are, there are um, generations before had divisions between aspects of life. And I think they're a much more integrated generation on that. So that's why they expect us to give them a month off to go backpacking. This is why so many employers, so many employers invest in wellness centers, fitness, because wellness, my health, my mental health, my physical health, my eating, all of that, you should be concerned about because it, it's part of my life. And life is work, and work is life. So with that, what questions, reactions, thoughts you have? I love that you're uh, laying on the work is life, because I'm sitting here thinking about that. 
And I wonder, because we are in a very traditional environment, I mean, we're employed by the government sector, um, how, and maybe it's just more of a statement, you know, it, it, it's somewhat difficult for us to be able to allow for the freedom and flexibility that um, might come with a Google or a Disney employer or you know Ohio State University or, or any of the other places. Because you know we're we're beholden to the people outside, those taxpayers, the residents and so on. And you know, to, to say, um, what are you doing on your computer? Aren't you supposed to be working? You know, you, you know what? So Absolutely. it's 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 really I mean I think for us as leaders and as for us who are not millennials, um, you know, we, we probably sound like, you know, old buddy buddies. Because we're we're in we're in a very specific structure, very specific environments, not unlike outside. Yeah, so there are two things I want to say there. One thing I want to say and then one thing I want to ask the group. So the one thing is we also have to realize that when we look at millennials, say on their computer, sometimes our eyes will see that as non-work related. We'll automatically assume no one you're doing work. And if you ask them, or if we say stop that, you're supposed to be doing work, they'll reveal to us, I actually am doing work. Um, it's just that look like the kind of work that you thought, you know. So we we think uh, I, I've had times. I mean, I'll pick on Derek again. So Derek, and you know, I'll be walking somewhere. I'm like, I wonder, you know, Mr. Johns wants me to speak to this audience. I wonder um, how many senior executives there are in the county. And we'll be walking, and like I'll just take three steps. I ask the question, and on the third step, Derek will say there are 172. I'm like, how do you know that? He can tell you. I say this all the time. I'm like, how do you? I don't even know why you're doing that kind of information. He's like, I don't. I just looked it up on my phone. In three steps. Sometimes I'll look at uh, my staff members' computers and I'll think, is anybody doing work today? And they actually are. But they're, how they access information, the use of Google to answer questions, um, just complete comfort and reliance on technology as a source of information um, is not something that all people in the workplace, uh, that's not the first place they would go. You know, so you say, I need you to do me a favor and, um, what's your name? Kevin. I need to get a message to Kevin. Some people would have said, you want me to talk to Kevin? Let me go call Kevin. Some people say, oh, no, I'm, I'm fancy. I don't do the calling. I'm going to go email. Okay. Other people say, I need to get a message to Kevin. And in two seconds, they tweeted him. They text him. They put it on Facebook. They linked into him. I mean, and what we and we look at it, we're like, I thought I just said go talk to Kevin, and you're on email, you're on Facebook, you're on Twitter. And they're like, I'm doing exactly what you told me to do, but I happen to know that Kevin responds better to this versus email. Those kinds of things are really important to keep in mind because I think that's how communication and work flow in the workplace, but it's very different looking. So to your other part side of your question, like what ideas do you have? I mean, as government employees, how might you reward or offer? Millennials in the workplace, some flexibility in ways that honors taxpayers' dollars and is appropriate. Yes? I think something that you kind of brought up is how employers are trying to have wellness programs. There, there, there used to be a gymnasium in this building that people could use, and there you know, it used to be facilities for people to try to stay healthy. And they do provide sometimes classes like yoga classes at lunchtime. And to expand upon those things, because I do think having two kids who are millennials, they tell me they want to work somewhere. Ride a bike to work, take a shower, and then they're going to be more productive. And the taxpayers can't look at that and think, well, they're wasting time, because that's something that's going to benefit their productivity, their happiness, their contentedness in their workplace, and their health at the same time. So that's something that, as a county entity, government entity, would not be out of the ordinary or be off the wall. That's great. Others? Yes. I think also create processes and even space um, to allow for those ideas to take place. So, you know, sometimes people tell you that, hey, you can share an idea, but there's not necessarily a clear process where you send an email and you never hear anything back. So not only, you know, having that process to share the idea, but then like you, to speak to you, the feedback that they need to have something in place to, for them to get the feedback. Um, I was just gonna say that I, I think that it's important for us to expose our young leaders 
to different groups of people. I like the idea of having them present in front of senior leadership so that they can critique their craft and also receive that feedback. And on a separate note, I, I think dress down days is a great way to reward um, staff members. And I know that oftentimes we do that on Fridays or what have you, but I think that um, they really appreciate the opportunity to come and be comfortable while they work. And it does not affect productivity, and they do look at it as a reward. Absolutely. So these talks just happen to dovetail. So yesterday I was at Franklin County Children's Services, and we were talking about, like, what is it about their culture, their um, agency, that makes it uh, distinct from other agencies in the county, but also a rewarding place to work. And one woman raised her hand, she said, because we can wear jeans on Friday. And she pointed to the director who allows that to happen now. And so I think there is this idea that they see it as a reward. It's also a way to just, and it does not affect productivity. It actually, it, it was her answer to a place where I feel like I love working. I feel like I belong here. So in 2012, I wrote a book about belonging. And the point about belonging is people perform optimally in conditions and places where they belong. If they fit in, they feel valued and respected, performance and productivity are optimal. And maybe genes is just one way, one of many ways that they start to get there. Yes? Flexible hours. And this is for supervisors, for managers, for those, as well as coworkers. So peers, people, to schedule time with them and say, I just want to get to know you. Where are you from? What's your background? Where are you going? Like, where do you see yourself going? What's your goals, aspirations? Have you thought at all about process? How to get there? Um, really important. So I find myself now, um, and I have to do some of this because I'm the director. So when staff come and say, you know, what, what do you want to do here? There are times where I have an like, I know what we need to do. Or I have an opinion about where we need to go. But I find myself more and more asking myself in my head before I say anything, do I have an opinion on this? Is it strong? And do I need to have an opinion? Or can I let them decide on this? Have some input. Why don't you come up with this strategy? Come up with one or two recommendations in place before me. Whereas before, I was quick to say yes, go here, go left, do this, say no, say yes, let's move um, by Friday. Now I find myself trying to build more um, opportunities for them to develop and grow and have input. Hear their ideas. One, realizing that I don't have all the ideas in the world, because I don't, none of us do. Um, and that I, although they want to look up, this is really important, they want to look up to us for leadership, for guidance, because mom and dad have done it, guardians have done it, teachers have done it, professors have done it. So they want us to just, just tell me what I have to do. Um, I think to really grow them, and the, I love the Jaron phrase that said, leading them in the workplace. So if we're really gonna lead them, not pull them, um, we had to let them have some independence and agency. And one way you do it is by asking yourself, is this a place where I really have to have an opinion? If not, why don't let them think about this for a little bit? Come and give me some ideas. Let's take one or two more questions because we, we know some people have dockets to get to. They have magistrates in here who are looking at you like, move along. <laughs> Any, like, one or two more questions? Because I said that I stopped it. Okay, good. Um, I'm wondering, as I was listening to you, I can hear the thoughts, and I remember being at Ohio State and teaching millennials when we were undergraduate, and there had been such competition among them for so long that you know, they would come to me and if they were going to get a B plus in their psychology class, it was going to ruin their entire future. I mean, does that resonate at all with, with what you're talking about, the way that, you know, conversation, I will, I'll never become a physical therapist if I get a B plus, or, you know, and it's like they had this, there's such competition for those positions. It wasn't like it was, you know, earlier where there could be more diversity, like there's so many people that qualify that we can do a whole 
Yeah, so I think in the, in the workplace um, implications, one, there is this sense of um, competition. So they're, they're all motivated to be whatever the high position is, right? And there are many more people who qualify now for this high position. So they're trying to outpace and outperform each other. And I think sometimes, you know, healthy competition is good. It drives innovation, it drives efficiency, it drives all of those things in workplaces. But it can also be quite divisive and it can get in the way of people working on teams. So as managers, as supervisors, as coworkers, as leaders, I think it's our responsibility then to um, clarify when there really is no need, you know, everyone can be plus and everyone can go on and get the job they want, but everyone can also do well in their various assignments or their various tasks, their various workloads, and still be promoted or rewarded how we're gonna do it. So I think that's one place it shows me the workplace. And the second is, um, so there's the idea that these students, you know, they have to get the B plus or their life is ruined. Relates to the fact that for many of them, they, they know where they're, they know where they want to go. Like I can see the end, or at least part of it. Now I'm not sure how to get from here to that place. And, but I bet you it's like I gotta go here and then go here and go there and go there. And they miss, they can go all the way over there, or that many of us got to where we're going through very circuitous paths. That there is no one single path. And that Contrary to what there really aren't things you can do in your whole life as room. You can recover from a lot of things in life. I remember yesterday, um, so the director of the center's uh, share with at Franklin County Children's Services, I had a young man from Ohio State do a spoken word um, performance as part of my presentation, and he's living with a disability. And then at the end of the day, he, he reported to me that people in the agency came to said, well, I'm living with a disability. He thought, this person is a whatever, director they have a disability. Because for him, he's not, he, he assumes everybody who's in their position right now got there perfectly, don't have any problems, just got there, life has been perfect, they made every right decision, they've made no mistakes, and it was a direct path. And I think we can help them as we take them out and get to know them, um, as we give them genes on Friday, and we get to know their name and say, let me tell you a little bit about me and how I got here. And my path wasn't easy. And, um, and here's how I made these decisions. Sometimes they weren't even conscious decisions. I just sort of fell into an opportunity, and as a result of that, here I am today. I think those kinds of stories can be really empowering to them because they're often looking for a plan. A goes to B, goes to C, goes to D, and then I get to E. And life is not always that. Thank you.